I'm excited to continue our conversation with William Marks. And no, we're not. <laughs> It'd be nice to have William Marks here, though. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our final conversation with John Dinger and Cheryl Bruno, they are the co-authors of Come Up Hither to Zion, it's a fantastic biography of William Marks. We're going to talk about uh, William Marks joining with James Strang and uh, some of the Thompsonites and some really interesting ways that he got around finally to the RLDS church. So you will, we're also going to dive in with John. He was one of the uh, co-authors with uh, Cheryl on Secret Covenants. John's a lawyer, and we're going to talk about legal reasons why Joseph probably denied polygamy. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Well, very good. So Brigham Young heads west. Mark stays in the Midwest and joins with James Strang. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Cheryl, take it away. Okay, so um, James Strang was also a prime contender um, because he was not originally for polygamy. So you have many people in the Midwest who will join jo James Strang because he does not um, advocate polygamy, at least at first when he... And he had a pretty good claim to the presidency. He had what he considered a letter of appointment from Joseph Smith, um, which many people thought was very valid, and he had an angelic visitation, um, and he had many of the strong leadership of the church came to him. William Marks was one of them. Um, there were others that William Smith, the Smith family, was with him for a short time, and so he had a pretty good gathering of people um, as he was in Wisconsin. But then the evil villain John C. Bennett joined the Strangites, <laughs> and Marx wasn't very happy about that. Tell us about that. No, we, we don't have actual letters or writings specifically, but we do know that his involvement with the Strangites uh, went to basically nothing when John C. Bennett was very active. And then once Bennett... That left. can't be a coincidence. No, and then once Bennett left, he became sort of active again before he tapered off. Okay, so I remember hearing a presentation at MHA, and somebody in the audience said that John C. Bennett was the downfall of both Joseph Smith and James Strang. <laughs> Could be some truth in that. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, Cheryl, can you talk a little bit about, so after John C. Bennett leaves the Strangite, Marx is strong until polygamy rears its head again. Right, and um, Strang is a very interesting character because um, he doesn't just practice the patriarchal polygamy of Brigham Young. Mm -hmm. His polygamy is a little different, and he believes in the equality of women. He believes in the equality of blacks. He's um, got uh, legal, he becomes a representative for... Is it Wisconsin in the Senate or something? I, I can't remember. Oh, it was exact. Michigan, I think. Michigan. Wasn't it? You're yeah. talking about Strang being a state legislator? Right, state yeah, yeah. legislator. The king of Beaver Island and a, and a yes, legislator. Yes, so he's a very upright character. And um, it seems that Bennett had a lot of influence there. Um, he brings in Freemasonry. Um, and then, you know, he does, I think, um, kind of bring in polygamy as well. But um, Strang... Is he practices it a little bit differently than some of the others? Well, he definitely wasn't a polygamy insider in Nauvoo, James Strang. No, no, he yeah. was. He wasn't an insider of any type right. in Nauvoo. Okay. So after, um, I think William Marks becomes a little disillusioned with the Strangites, and then he looks around. Who else is in contention for leading the... Because he wants to belong to a restoration church. Mm -hmm. He believes in the Book of Mormon. He believes in restoration. So then he goes with um, Charles Thompson right. and the Benemiites. <laughs> so that's a very interesting group. And uh, we write a little bit about it in the chapter of kind of what they were all about. And, and they had a strange name, too. It was like... The Congregation of the... Presbytery of Je Jehovah or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's a very but long name. It didn't name. sound very mm -hmm. Latter-day It's a Masonic name. It's good. He had a lot of Masonic um, kind of influence in, the, in his group. But they are for gathering. Charles Thompson wants to find a place of gathering. 
And I think that, um, and he chooses William Marks as one of the committee that is going to search for a place of gathering. And William Marks actually becomes very active in, in trying to find a place of gathering. And one of, the, one of the themes of the book is gathering. So we talk about the gathering under Joseph Smith, the gathering under James Strang, but he's very involved with Charles Thompson in trying to find a place of gathering. Okay. And then he fades out of that as well. Well, well, actually, during this time period, I think we get the best insight into William Marks and his okay. beliefs because we do have a, a dozen or so letters from this time period. And, it, and it's fascinating to me where with um, Thompson, he, he's in, but not. And he'll even say things to that effect during that time and a little bit after just how he's sick of being fooled. As he um, looks back on his time with Charles Thompson, mm-hmm. he, he kind of regrets a lot of things. Yeah. And so Thompson, that is the time period where I think everybody who didn't know three facts about William Marks, but they know one, that's when he publishes his account oh. of the meeting with Joseph Smith two to three weeks before the martyrdom where Joseph says, I've been fooled, we're ruined people, this is a curse, you need to start excommunicating people, we need to, we either leave the United States or this is gonna, polygamy is gonna prove our our downfall. Which Brigham Young did leave the United States. (laughs) Yes, he did. So yeah, that was published in 1853, so probably no coincidence that in 1852, they announced, you know, the LDS Church announced polygamy to the world, but um, that's kind of the one fact that most people I would say know about yeah. William Marks is this this account. Well, and Marks claims that Joseph Smith said polygamy was a mistake, right? I have been deceived. I have been deceived. Joseph Smith has been deceived. Okay. So, yes. Okay. So, that's the only source we have for that? Because I know Quinn talked about that. It is not the only source. Oh. So, he actually re- recounted this multiple times throughout his life. So, we actually have, my count is at least five accountings of this where he repeated it and it was all very consistent. Um, the, the one slight inconsistency is when it was published in the RLDS paper at the time, they took out the, I have mm-hmm. been deceived. Um, but basically everything else was just as he said it. And so, yeah, this wasn't a one-time thing. He said it uh, at least five, six, five times over 16 years, all very consistent. So, Cheryl, do you think Joseph really said that, or is, is Marx making this up? Oh, I think there's no up? doubt that there was a meeting that Joseph talked to him about polygamy. Um, what We're not real sure exactly what it means, because um, it's a little bit cloudy as to, was Joseph just saying that he had been deceived and that people were practicing polygamy, or was he saying that he had actually practiced polygamy and he'd been deceived? Um, did he want? Did he actually want people to be excommunicated for polygamy because they were doing the wrong thing, or was he again going to publicly excommunicate them and then bring them again in through the back door? Um, did he want William Marks to help him do this? Um, did William Marks know what he was doing? So there's, you know, there's questions about the account, but it's very interesting because, and I think that William Marks kind of left it vague purposely because he's talking to people who do not believe in polygamy. So it's very, oh. he's, he's treading gingerly, but he's trying to be forthright and tell the truth. Uh, but at the end, so I'd argue, one of these is he talks to a missionary, Mark Forscott. And, and I think if you take that account in, in its whole, uh, right. he is absolutely saying it because uh, this Mark Forscott just flat out asks, you know, basically was Joseph Smith a polygamist? And, and Mark says, uh, Yes, he and John C. Bennett were the first to go into it. And so very clearly says it at that time. Uh, Yeah, the, I mean, this is pure speculation, not in the book because it is pure speculation, but it, well, this is not speculation. This absolutely happened 100%. This meeting happened. Uh, The speculation is I truly believe Joseph Smith was just trying to buy time until polygamy allies like the 12 got back in town. Okay, so Joseph didn't mean what he said? I don't think so. Oh, that's interesting. That's what my presentation at Sunstone was just oh, on, this whole there thing. Were... So, yeah, it, it, this, this, uh, it, the questions we always get asked, right, are, are the two, did this meeting really happen and did Joseph Smith mean it? And uh, 
I can answer the first question. He, this absolutely happened uh, with all the other stuff going on. The, the second question is the more interesting one. Did Joseph Smith mean it? Hmm. Well, very good. Right, and so just before you leave that subject, um, there are other accounts of people meeting with William Marks and talking about the subject, and some of the accounts um, are a little bit different, and so like especially the RLDS accounts um, will say that, um, you know, give the slant of Joseph Smith um, was, was going to destroy polygamy or something like that. But the Forescott letter is more reliable because it's written in, in William Marx's very own handwriting. It's one of the few times that we have his handwriting and the other accounts are just, you know, later by someone else. They're sometimes taken from notes that don't exist and, you know, they're, they're more difficult to give credence to. But the one to force cut is very strong. Okay. Well, very good. I would love to keep talking about this. We'll, we'll conclude with William Marks because I want to talk about your chapter in Secret Covenants as well. Um, but basically, Marks joins the what we what was then called the RLDS Church, although I think they probably just called it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. It wasn't until the I think they called it the reorganization. Well, oh, they did do that. That's right. But. Um, so he joins with the RLDS church and then dies in that church. Well, there, there's something really interesting there okay. that, that I think is important. The reorganization originally was founded without Joseph Smith III. Right. And they were petitioning him to, to come lead them, and he always put them off until William Marks joined. And once William Marks joined the reorganization... Um, it was at that point that Joseph Smith III decided to come. And in fact, when he wrote a letter to the reorganization to tell them I, I've accepted, he writes it to William Marks. Oh, wow. And so uh, William Marks uh, was, was very key in getting him to come uh, to the reorganization and I think very key in, the, in, in that church. Okay, so Marks gave that group legitimacy Essentially, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, not to say they weren't, they were, they were illegitimate before Marx. Well, but, but in Joseph Smith the Third's eyes. It, yes, I think um, Joseph Smith. So well, Joseph Smith the Third, you know, was raised hearing the stories of his father mm -hmm. and Nauvoo and that kind of thing. But, but uh, he would always talk fondly of William Marx, and that clearly came from Emma. Uh, when Marx left Nauvoo, he went to Fulton City, and that's where Emma actually went after. So Emma and the Marx families lived together for about a year, uh, not together in the same house, but together amongst themselves until Emma went back to Nauvoo. And so they really had that association. So I think, not, not that they were illegitimate or anything, it was a wonderful group of, of believers. But yes, once Marx joined them, that probably caught Joseph III's attention and uh, probably made him think, I, I need to let, think a little, a little harder about this. Hmm. And William Marks also ordained Joseph Smith III as the president of the oh, organization. Oh, that's quite the honor. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Well, cool. Well, I just want to let everybody know, um, both Cheryl and John have signed this, and I've got another book to give away. This is just great. Go to gospeltangents.com slash contest and you could win this autographed copy. Let's take a minute because I, I know, John, you need to run. We'll, we'll keep Cheryl around. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you've written a chapter in Secret Covenants, which I have right here. And um, it's, it's, it's about the legal history of polygamy in Nauvoo. So uh, let's, let's dive in there and spend a few minutes talking about your chapter here in Secret Covenant. All right. So this may not be everybody's cup of tea. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say that right <laughs> out the bat. I, I think it might be a little different, but uh, maybe, maybe that's just me. But it's called Nauvoo Polygamy and the Law, Statutory and Common Law Prohibitions. So if the title is making you fall asleep, <laughs> I don't know how much you'll like it. Uh, but, but mine, what I'm doing is... I think there's a real lack of uh, sort of nuance and sophistication when people talk about the law being broken, whether it be uh, polygamy or adultery or whatever in Nauvoo. Um, to simply just say it was against the law or it wasn't, um, 
uh, we lose a lot of nuance there. So I, I take some time to kind of go through what statutes were on the books and then the common law as well that was in force at the time and look at those with different cases and decisions to show what activities, you know, kind of would or would not be. And so one of it is just, is just that. Um, I write it because I think that's necessary and people can go and look and, and hopefully that'll be a resource when people write about this kind of thing. But the other point of it is the problem that I'm having is there are apologists who are really intent on showing that Joseph Smith never broke the law. That's very important to them for some reason. And I think those that deny his uh, living polygamy kind of latch on to those arguments. And I don't think apologists doing that are, are doing that on purpose. But I'm not trying to support the polygamy no, skeptics. No, but it, it's being used in those, those arguments. Uh, and so I want to show that there really is, there really was a criminal risk to being forthright about one's polygamy. And I think one of the things that people are missing are Liberty Jail was horrific for those men. Um, Joseph Smith and those others truly suffered when they were in the hands of the law. And so as you look at the setting up of Nauvoo, the Nauvoo Charter, the laws they're passing, the habeas corpus things, Joseph Smith is not going back to jail. I mean, the, the whole government of Nauvoo is set up that way. And so these polygamy denials that he makes from the stand, I mean, these are, are legal denials. These are, he is aware that he could face criminal prosecution for this. Um, and so it, that's also part of it is, is showing that that is a very real possibility. He would have been prosecuted. There were people in Nauvoo at the time who were prosecuted uh, for bigamy, for adultery, uh, that. And then I talk about his, uh, his indictment in May of 1844 before his death for adultery and fornication. Okay. And so can you go into a little bit more detail there? You're, you're saying that the public denials that Joseph did were not religious denials. Correct. Okay, and so we should read them in that way and not, like, he's just trying to stay out of jail? <laughs> that, that there is a very, very real risk. He has to make these denials because um, he could face prosecution. So one of the cases I talk about that got brought up before the high council, uh, this uh, Thorpe, um, he was brought up uh, in front of the high council for uh, polygamy. Uh, he had a living wife. And uh, he married another woman. So he was called in front of the high council. Uh, the wife number one and wife number two showed up. But he sent a message uh, that I am not coming. I am afraid of being prosecuted and sent to the penitentiary. And so he didn't show up to his high council meeting. Uh, and he was excommunicated. That was William Marks as well. Okay. Um, but, but to show, Marks was presiding. Yes, he was presiding. <laughs> uh, but to show that there was a real risk of prosecution. Okay. Now, let me ask you one other question about that, because I talked to Marianne Clements a couple of years ago, I think it was, about counterfeiting in Nauvoo. Mm -hmm. And she said one of the issues with Nauvoo having such a strong habeas corpus I mean, it was designed to keep Joseph out of jail, but a lot of criminals said, oh, this is useful to me too. <laughs> and so it, it ended up bringing in a lot of criminals who took advantage of this habeas corpus in order to avoid the law. Is, is that a problem as well? Well, it could be. And so habeas corpus doesn't really fit into this much, but let's talk about it because I wrote an article on it. Okay. Um, so habeas corpus is just a... a you know, it means bring the body. So if someone's arrested, they can then file a motion uh, of habeas corpus. They're then brought in front of the closest judge. So that would have been in Nauvoo. Uh, in Nauvoo. Conveniently. Yes. Uh, and then that court could discharge them, right? Uh, either cancel the warrant or it, 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 they strengthened their habeas corpus acts as they went on. I think there were eight that were passed. And I mean, it got to the point where... Um, if you come here trying to arrest Joseph Smith for Missouri troubles, you can go to prison kind of thing. Um, 
so, so that could be, I mean, Marianne's brilliant and everybody should listen to her, but yeah. I mean, you still have to get the presiding judge who was oftentimes Joseph Smith as the, the, the chief justice of the Nauvoo um, city court would be the mayor. W- wasn't Marx also a judge? So he was, he was on the municipal court. Okay. So kind of two layers of courts. Um, but the top one was the mayor who would be Joseph Smith. And, and so while people could do that, they still have to go in front of a judge. Um, I mean, just because you file a motion for habeas corpus to be discharged, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Okay. But, you know, it seems like, if, if I remember correctly, some of the criminal elements, especially the counterfeiting guys, uh, took advantage of this because they're like, oh, hey, I'm going to join the Mormon church so that I can avoid jail time, right? Yeah, well, I don't know. Okay. Uh, but I know that one of the reasons, too, why there was a criminal element that's not view is just you're on the border. I mean, you can hop on a boat and get to Iowa, oh, right? Okay. Uh, like Short Creek, right? Okay. <laughs> you, can, you can get on the other side of a border pretty quickly. So um, I, I'd have to defer to, to someone who has their expertise on, okay. on uh, counterfeiting. Okay. Well, that would be Marianne. And I keep telling her, Marianne, you need to write that book. <laughs> uh, and I would agree. <laughs> so I have to say one thing about John's chapter in this book is he says it might not be for everyone, but I disagree. I think it is for everyone because... He uses um, stories and court cases, not only the Mormon ones, but also those from Illinois that are so interesting. Yeah. They're and very I add, interesting. I was trying to read it, but I just didn't have time. I got through like two or three pages of your chapter, and it was really good. The two Thank or three you. pages yes. were really good. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's not just legalese. It's yeah. you know stories of what's happening, and they're very interesting. Well, I just want to thank you, John and Cheryl, for writing an amazing book, Come Hither to Zion, and for combining with uh, On Secret Covenants. These are both fantastic books. 2024 is the year of awesome Mormon books. (laughs) And so I want to thank you both for being here on Gospel Tangents. And if you didn't win either one of these, Go buy them. Go buy two. Go buy three. <laughs> Give them to your friends. <laughs> I appreciate that, and I agree. All right. Everyone needs thank three you. copies. <laughs> <laughs> well, John and Cheryl, thank you so much for being here on Gospel Tangents. Really appreciate it. Thank you thank for you. having us. Mm-hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Cheryl Bruno and John Dinger. They are the co-authors of Come Up Hither to Zion. William Marks and the Mormon Concept of Gathering. So it's a fantastic book. You should really get it for sure. Um, We're not done with Cheryl just yet. We're going to dive more into her other book, Secret Covenants, and uh, talk more about Emma Smith's denials. Did a marriage even happen uh, where where, um, Emma agreed to... Was part of the ceremony. Right. So that's what I kind of investigated in this chapter. And so was Emma part of the ceremony? <laughs> I believe there is good reason to, to think that she was not a part of the ceremony. Oh, wow. That's quite a wrinkle. Mm-hmm. Thanks for listening, and I hope you to continue to enjoy Gospel Tangents. Be- consider becoming a Patreon or go to gospeltangents.com shop, and you can get a cool tie, a hat, or even a nice mug. You can also get a sweatshirt. So check it out at gospeltangents.com shop.